Popcorn Junkies and welcome to the Popcorn Junkies. <laughs> this is a movie review of um, a very serious and important film. This is a movie review of The Zone of Interest. This is the new film by Jonathan Glazer. Um, if, for those of you who don't know who Jonathan Glazer is, he probably most famously directed Sexy Beast, the movie starring Ray Winston and Ben Kingsley um, in a sort of gangster flick with a difference. Um, he also made Under the Skin. I mean, he was also responsible for the other film I haven't seen of his uh, was Birth. I haven't seen Birth, but um, Under the Skin was a film that really spoke to me on so many levels. The uh, Scarlett Johansson film uh, based on the is it Michelle Faber book. He's, he's, he's a visionary. I mean, he's an incredibly unique, um, singular filmmaker. It's taken him 10 years, pretty much, to make each of his films. I mean, this 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 film, um, The Zone of Interest, has taken 10 years to make. The film before that took uh, seven or eight years. Um, you know, he's an incredibly thoughtful, thought-provoking filmmaker, takes his projects very seriously, meticulous amount of preparation and research goes into each of them. I curiously found out that actually he was the director behind, infamously, many years ago, the very famous Guinness advert, I don't even remember, with the white horses in the sea kind of coming into land. And I think, if I'm right, they use a sort of techno track by Left Field. Which, if all of this is correct, which I believe it is, means I've interviewed him because I remember interviewing the director of the White Horse's Guinness advert years and years ago. So here's the thing, the, the zone of interest, there's been a lot of press around this. It's been nominated for Best Picture, I think Best Director. Um, it stars Sandra Huller and Christian Friedel. And it's a film that's loosely, and when I say loosely, it's very loosely, uh, by all accounts, based on the book by Martin Amis. Um, this, is, this is a tough watch. You know, it's a film about Auschwitz. It's about the Holocaust. And the reason I've kind of taken my time and wanted to really let this bed in and think about this review is because I think it comes at an incredibly important moment in our own history and could speak to and be important and instructive and useful um, as a tool uh, to help us all moving forward. I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the Israel-Gaza uh, um, crisis which has a, an added potency when you consider, obviously, uh, Israel, the state of Israel, emerged out of the atrocities of World War II. And this film is, Jonathan Glazer is Jewish, this film is about Auschwitz. But it's, it's done and it's told and it's, its approach to its portrait of Auschwitz is incredibly original. And it's a very counterintuitive way of actually making us think about the awfulness, the horrors of um, what happened in the Holocaust uh, and in Auschwitz and other concentration camps around Europe. Um, but it does it in a very sort of indirect and I would argue very clever and as I say, counterintuitive way. Um, so what is it about? This is this is the story of Rudolf, Rudolf Hoss. Rudolf Hoss was one of the, if you like, architects or one of the kind of key um, uh, officers uh, responsible for the industrial um, annihilation of millions of Jews. And so this is a portrait of him and his wife and his family. The simplest way to describe what this film does, by focusing on the ordinary day-to-day Germanic family life of an ordinary family who happen to live alongside and for whom whose key job is the management, if you like, of Auschwitz. It's about how ordinary their life's concerns are, what their goings on are, their family life, their worries about work, their worries about home, their ambitions, their family life. It's, it's, it's about the ordinariness and the dangers of just living an ordinary life sat alongside one of the most appalling atrocities known to man going on alongside you and the extent to which you can or can anyone, how can anyone lead a normal life, an ordinary life with all the normal kind of aspirations, dreams, fears, worries, familial relationships. How can one live a normal life when this kind of awfulness is happening alongside you? You don't see the awfulness, but what you certainly do is you hear the awfulness. You hear the industrial scale of destruction and annihilation essentially happening beyond the beyond the uh, the Auschwitz camp walls. So this is a portrait of a family. So as I've said, through po portraying the ordinariness of this family, we get an underlining of the horror of what's going on by not being over dramatic about what's going on. It becomes more and more gut-churningly awful, the realisation that they can live alongside such horror that's being enacted 
within Auschwitz. So this is a challenge. This is a film that really is, from the get-go, trying to present the ordinariness, as I say, of day-to-day -day living in this house. As I say, Rudolf Hoss is played by Christian Friedel. Um, and interestingly, Sandra Huller, who you, you may know from Anatomy of a Fall, she plays his wife, or as she likes to call herself at a certain point in the film, the Queen of Auschwitz. Um, it's a dispassionate portrait. Um, Jonathan Glazer, the director, has talked about how they used a sort of big brother approach, where they kind of constructed the set, they constructed the building, they created many holes, they put in um, CCTV like cameras like they have in Big Brother in the house to film film the lives, to film the characters going about what they were doing. And, and so the actors have talked about how it wasn't like a conventional film set where you had so there were some set scenes, obviously, where you would be directed normally, but there were many instances where they were going about their day to day activities and the cameras would pick up the action, if you like. And so what we get quite quickly in this film is a bureaucratic ordinariness, a sort of familial suburban ordinariness. You've got this house, it's a kind of suburban house. You've got this garden, a beautiful garden with picket fences and roses well tended to. You've got a sense of this family living its life. They have servants and it come, becomes clear across the course of the film that these servants are actually uh, inmates or prisoners from Auschwitz who are very deferential and very fearful. You don't see any overtly nasty behaviour specifically towards these these servants but <laughs> that in itself is kind of chilling because they just don't see them. We experience them as a couple, we experience them as a family. We, we start, I think, with them sort of all going for a family swim. They have friends around, they have guests around, they celebrate birthdays. It's the ordinary tick-tock of a family life. Um, you know, they, they, we, we see footage of Sandra Huller trying on a new fur coat and of course it dawns on us that much of what's coming over, the new coats, the new items of clothing, teeth, gold, jewellery, lipstick and there's a particular moment which i want to talk about with the lipstick but they're essentially they they have their pick of the clothes and the articles and belongings of people who've passed through auschwitz and they feel nothing there is no there's no sort of guilt there's no moral kind of you know there's no moral kind of dilemma here for them it's she tries it on and it's an incredibly chilling moment it's in the trailer where she's sort of trying on this fur coat and you know that it's come from someone who's obviously gone into the gas chambers we see you know him as a father rudolf Hoss taking his children out you see and what's really quite chilling very clever in the kind of direction of what they do when they're out, when they go looking at wildlife, when they go fishing. Rudolf Hoss talks about listening and hearing and seeing and this film reminds you that this family and Germans throughout World War II perhaps and not all Germans but obviously huge numbers of Germans and you could argue that it's the same thing going on in Israel. They can see and they can be moved by and they can identify and hear those aspects of nature and the real world that they want to see which makes it even more chilling that they can't hear the grinding wheels, the cogs, the, the fires, the burning furnaces, all that, the, the sounds of industry that are essentially grinding away in the background. And what you have to understand is this film, all the way through it, Jonathan Glazer has talked about two films being made. There's the picture film, the visual film, obviously, and then there's the film that's the sound film. There are two films. And that grinding sound of industry in the background is a curious one because the way in which, you know, Rudolf Holst and his family are situated in perspective to his job, he gets on his and he goes through the gate, which is right next to his front door, and he goes into Auschwitz, the camp. It's like it's a factory. It's like he's going onto the shop floor. It's just that rather than producing cars or rather than producing radios or phones or whatever, he's producing misery. He's producing annihilation. He's producing mass murder. And the film's soundtrack and his bureaucratic approach to his work and his own ambition within the work... Um, his cursory approach, if you like. There's a moment where uh, other German officials and business people come in with a new design, literally a sort of architect's drawing design of a new oven, a, a rotating gas oven. And they talk about its productivity and they talk about it. And so ostensibly what you're watching in this film is an incredibly boring scene of administration and bureaucracy as they sit around and they talk about the pros and cons and how the rotation of the oven will move and they're talking technically and it's very clever because you're constantly in this film being snagged back because not well not just because of but you are aware of what you're watching because you know what the film's about but the soundtrack is forever dragging you back to the fact that yes this is industry yes this is a business if you like but then you are forever in your own head and heart reminded by and revulsed by uh, the the constant reawakening and re-realisation, if you like, of what on earth they're talking about. They're talking about the productivity of an oven or a, 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 crema, a cremation oven, crematorium, that rotates so they can maximise productivity. And when they talk about productivity, they're talking about more speedily killing people, killing Jewish people. 
and yet again threaded through and this is where a real shout out needs to be given to Christian Friedel and Sandra Hula. It could be, oh, you know, they're, they're, yes they've got CCTV cameras knocking about, yes there are scenes of great ordinariness but what you pick up is they're also, they're also, she's a mother and he's a father and they're in a relationship. They have their own, you know, he has quite a tender relationship with his children, um, you know, and so you think how can you feel, how can he feel love? for his children and not have any compassion for what's going on here. And, and this is something that really kind of troubles me about the Israel-Gaza crisis is there are times when you hear some of the language that's being used by some of the sort of far-right ministers in Israel and you think, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, you're talking about humans here, you're talking about people, even if even if you just don't agree with what they believe or what values, they, you're talking about humans and, and it's the total disregard for humanity that keeps creeping in in this. And there's a strong argument to say that this film will alienate many people who watch it. It doesn't try and make the process of watching it easy. It doesn't give you many kind of, if you like, what I would call sort of dramatic pinch points where you build to a mini crescendo of dramatic kind of intensity and then it subsides and then you move on. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's like a, it's, it, it's as mundane, it's quite mundane, but it's the mundanity of it that's what makes the cumulative effect of the film quite chilling. Well, not quite chilling, incredibly chilling. And so you, you, you feel like you're literally being sort of slowly cranked up and just built to a place of revulsion. And the reason I'm using the word revulsion is I think there's a really key moment in this film, near the, towards the end, near the end of this film, that, that, is a, that is a really crucial pinch point or moment for our lead character, Rudolf Hoss, the man responsible for gassing over a million Jews. So it looks, it's shot with pristine, even though it's CCTV cameras for a lot of the interiors of the house. It, uh, Jonathan Glazer's gone for an extraordinarily pristine, almost overly clean and delineated kind of footage. And I think that sterility and the cleanliness and the whiteness, when there's white, there's white, and the edges of everything is so clearly defined. I think that speaks to this idea of, again, a an administrative bureaucratic neatness and precision to what he was doing. There's almost a, I don't like to use the word in a throwaway fashion, I don't mean it like that, but you know that sort of almost OCD obsession with order and lines and cleanliness and this has a place and that has a place and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so that sort of just rams home that kind of, oh, there's a sterility at work here, a sterility to what they're doing, sterility to the consequences. And yet, even with that sterility, they still manage to function as a family. They have their own passions for each other. Their relationship is a relationship. Though I do think the film has a troubling detail in that I think in the end result, there is a strong argument, I would say, for considering the idea that Sandra Huller, the Queen of Auschwitz, his wife, comes across as almost more malevolent in a weird way than him. I mean, I mean, she doesn't, but there's that sort of strange idea that she doesn't want when he 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 gets to a point where he's going to be promoted. Hitler's going to promote him, and he can he'll have to leave the house, and he he can be responsible for more, for being more successful. Can you believe it? Uh, killing more people, uh, killing more Jewish people, um, and she's she throws a hissy fit that she doesn't want to leave the house. This is her home. What about the garden? What about the house? What about the kids? You know these are these are domestic conversations. These are ordinary domestic conversations that we all have about so many aspects of our lives, and then framed within this per perverse scenario where, oh my God, the, these are ordinary family concerns and dialogues and discussions that are actually quite boring, but important to the kind of structure of this family. Where are you going to live? How are you going to see the kids? When are we going to get home? Why am I, what are we going to do about the garden? All the while that this is actually, you're in a house alongside um, genocide and genocide is happening in the factory next to you. And the fact that they feel nothing all the way through this film, I was being reminded of, they don't really talk about it, but you, you, I, I kept thinking about what would the smell have been? What would have the smell have been in the in the air? The garden, this beautiful, meticulous garden. And I think this was really clever detail. The poster, one of the posters for the film is of a, of, of a red uh, poppy or rose or flower. The, 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 the flowers in the garden and the, and the verdancy, if you like, is undercut by the dark, depressive death, malevolence and evil that goes into feeding them. It's well known that ash and the, you know, compost and recycling is good for flowers. And there are a couple of moments where you see, presumably, the ash embers and the detritus that's come from the ovens of, of Auschwitz being tipped into the mulch, if you like, of a bed to feed the roses. And so you have a very stark idea that even the beauty of a flower is, is fed by the blood and the death of an entire people. And that it works on a very sort of insidious, 
impressionistic level, but again, it lends itself to this bilious feeling. I felt watching this a sort of sense of, of, of bile, of, of, of a, a sort of nausea. You know, this is a nauseous watch and it's going to be a tough watch. It's one of those films that you think, right, wow, how do you sell this to anyone? It's a difficult sell. It's, it's uncomforting, discomforting, it's alienating and it's nauseating and cumulatively so. The sound design is, is, is fantastic. And as I say, you know, uh, Jonathan Glazer and his sound, sound designer have talked about the fact that, you know, there were two films being made here, one on audio, one, one visual. The sound, I, you know, before I get to the judgment of how successful all of these aspects are, the sound is, is, is working incredibly hard. I mean, it's giving you all so many different, you, you hear screaming, you hear crying, you hear, you hear um, get ovens turned on, you hear guards shouting and cautioning, you hear gunshots, you hear the, the crying of children, the separation of people, you hear the a change in the gears of machinery, um, you hear vehicles, you hear trains coming in, you hear crowds, you hear rebellion, you hear revolt, you hear despair. Um, incredibly elaborate and, and sophisticated soundscape that that, that, it, that sits alongside most of this film. There is a soundtrack by Mika Levy. She did the soundtrack to uh, Under the Skin. Um, uh, interestingly, they, they they removed a lot of it. I think a uh, uh, good choice. It's just very intense chordal music right at the front. I think there might be some again at the end. I can't remember. But it's... It's interesting that they, Mika Levy created a soundtrack and then they ended up stripping it back quite a bit because I think to, to put any musical input into this would almost dilute the authenticity of quite a well curated and meticulously curated soundtrack that really does create this burgeoning sense of off camera awfulness. You are, you can never at any point in this film forget that the grind of total, total evil is happening off camera all the time and that's hugely powerful and hugely exhausting as well as you watch the film throughout the film as i say his work his ambition it's the ordinary ambition of a businessman you know he's got he wants he wants a promotion will he get a promotion she's got the ordinary ambitions or not of being a a wife with a family of the time you know she wants the best for her kids she wants to be in the nice place you've got these kids who have no real sense you wonder to what extent do they know what's going on over there i couldn't help but feel the suggestion with the children uh rudolf hoss's children the german children is that they kind of look out and they see what's going on you can see the kind of burning flames of the of the gas chambers you can see the you can see the you know the crematorium flames and smoke and all that kind of stuff and you could they can hear the screaming they hear the sound and you have this it doesn't say too much about that but you feel it go into the children his children and you wonder where does that go there's a really fascinating introduction of the character of Sandra Huller's mother so essentially Rudolf Hoss's mother-in-law comes to join them and live with them and her character is really interesting because what happens for her is she kind of just like a mother-in-law slots into this ordinary family sitting alongside appalling appalling actions that are going on in in her son-in-law's business her son-in-law's going concern if you like um, and her character comes in and she's with them for a while and it's really intriguing she becomes haunted by the flames coming from the crematorium and the chimneys and the factories where obviously they're burning the bodies of those that they've gassed and you can see it begins to, it snags her, it haunts her. She can't help but look out of the windows at night. She she finds it, slow, it, it slowly starts to sort of terrorise her and traumatise her. And in the end, you have this curious moment where Sandra Huller's mother has just disappeared. She's just gone. She's left without really, she leaves a note. But she hasn't really explained why. And she possibly doesn't even really understand herself, which I think is... An important detail in that it speaks to this idea in World War II that not everyone in Germany knew what was going on and that indeed on a just a on a visceral physical spiritual level if they had and if they did they 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 couldn't stomach it they couldn't they couldn't bear it and which leads you to think well where where is their refusal. Where is Sandra Huller? Where is this family? Where is Rudolf Hosses and his, his the Queen of Auschwitz, his wife's? Where is where is the horror going? Where how are they managing to curate their line of vision and justify this belief that what they're doing is right? And I think for me, one of the really ickiest moments where this there's a real kind of oh true horror horror in the ordinariness of something was is when Sandra Huller uses the lipstick that she finds in the pocket of a fur coat and she puts the lipstick on and you know as you're watching this that this lipstick has been used by a Jewish woman um, who is now dead or will soon be dead um, and you're thinking that the intimacy of the lips and the touch and that what she's putting on her lips she's not even thinking about the fact that this lipstick will have last been applied to the lips of the victim who once owned the coat and and, and that is truly traumatizing it's it, it, it you it's almost it's one of those films where 
you hear about abuse victims that it's only after the event that when they look back that they remember some of the details or some of the things or there'll be triggers in life that remind you of how awful or how compromised you were when you were younger and this film does that you get to the end of the film you think back to certain ordinary moments which should be just ordinary moments in a family and then you think they're not ordinary these are extraordinary these are that was the lipstick of a of an Auschwitz victim and she just put it on and then put it on the table and and so you can see how cleverly and how difficult this is to watch. There's also a moment earlier in the film where you feel, again, you sort of think, again, where are they positioning the horror of what it is they're doing? Because there's a moment where Rudolf Hoss takes his sons fishing and it's, they've got their waders on, they're standing in the river, they're fly fishing. And obviously the waste from Auschwitz, let's think of it as a factory at this point, the sort of waste that factories just pump out into their rivers. We hear about it all the time, don't we? Polluted rivers. Well, the pollutant that comes out of this factory, of course, are body parts. And whilst he's in the water fishing with his sons, suddenly it clouds up the water clouds up and body parts or bones pass through and he suddenly rushes to remove his children and the reason a moment like that is so important is it must speak to the fact that he wants to protect his sons from some aspect of what he's doing so there has to be some culpable shame and acknowledgement of the awfulness of what he's doing if he's wanting to protect his sons from you know being caught up in essentially the debris of dead people being pumped out into the river you know, I'm loath to say moments like that are beautiful because they're not. They're 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 horrific. They're horrendous. But this film is working on a. I would say, without wishing to sound like an absolute wanker, this film is working on a poetic, metaphorical level with a lot of the scenes and the footage and the moments. You are made to think in a sort of very abstract fashion. It, it this film makes you feel without really necessarily being able to intellectualise it. And I think that's quite important because your response is a guttural, it's, it's, it, as I say, it's a visceral response. You have a you have a physical and spiritual response to it. And so you do feel put upon. You feel the, you know, you, you I almost found myself getting irritated and irascible by just how ordinary all the shots were. I almost felt like I semi needed to be able to see the actual horror so that I could get a handle on it, so that I could just go and say, that, look at that, that's awful. And it's it's quite clever, this film, in that it steadfastly refuses to give you that kind of get out. Uh, it, it refuses to give you that visual ability to just go, oh my God, this is horrible, because that would puncture you for a moment. You'd, you'd feel like, not cathartic, but you would have let go of some of the bilge that was building in you, the spiritual sort of emotional, moral bilge that's building in you. If you saw the awfulness of bodies and what was actually happening in the camp, it would puncture that build. And I think what Jonathan Glazer is going for here is the most appallingly sort of nuanced, well-structured build of of revulsion. Um, and and I think he succeeds. I think he I think he really does succeed because you, you're never going to come out of this film going, oh, if you come out of this, I mean, you, obviously you can come out, and go, oh, that was a great film. You're not going to come out saying that. You're going to come out going, oh my God, that film has got through has gone to the very core of me it's drilled a hole through me and i think that's what this film does it does drill a hole through you this is a film in which all the normal things of everyday life jar what glazer and this film has managed to do is they've managed to manifest in or represent within one house and in one family the willful neglect and ability of a nation historically and nations to this day of turning the other cheek looking away when horrors unfold right beneath you, when perhaps your administration, your your people are actually enacting and perpetrating acts of such genocidal horror that you can distract in the ordinariness of day-to-day -day business, promotion, where are we going to live, what am I going to wear, what's in the garden, you know, it almost... It reminds you that almost it's our responsibility as humans to engage and be aware and be knowledgeable and be informed about the horrors that are going on so that they're not perpetrated again. And I think this film, I would hope that this film is taking the awfulness of what happened to the six million Jews of World War II and it's using it as a sermon, a lesson for us all to learn from and can be applied to any people of any nation whether it be Palestinian, Israeli, Ukrainian, whoever. And I think that, for me, is the hope with this film, that that's what this film will achieve. In terms of the, the extent of its success as well, oh, and there, there's an interesting and an important uh, uh, motif or device that runs all the way through this. And there's, there's, again, there's something very poetic about this. Uh, every now and then throughout the film, we cut to this sort of almost black and white infrared footage. It's not infrared because it's black and white, but it's shot like on an infrared camera of a young girl 
And we see this footage of this young girl running around into sort of debris. She's running through the camp. It's quite abstract. It's quite creepy. It's quite ghostly. I was getting almost Schindler's List, you know, the red, the girl in the red dress type of vibes. I'm not entirely sure if this worked, but when you read into it, by all accounts, Jonathan Glazer was, th th this was a sort of manifestation or representation, if you like, of a woman that he met in the research for this film over the 10 years, I think she's since passed away, where some of the prisoners of Auschwitz were working, say, outside, outside of Auschwitz, she would leave bits of uh, food for them. It is based upon a real woman who, who would do this. And in fact, uh, the young girl in the film is wearing the dress of the woman herself, who has sad, now sadly passed away. Um, and finally, the only other part of the film, which is an incredibly arresting moment, and I think it worked, was to right towards the end, spoiler alert, if a spoiler can be used in this regard, uh, where we cut to the order of them cleaning and preparing um, Auschwitz, the museum, in the modern day to be opened to the public. Um, and the contrast, you, know, you are struck by the idea that the only time you see inside Auschwitz is, uh, is, is when it's now a, a museum, uh, a sort of cautionary tale, a mausoleum, uh, to remind us of the awfulness of what happened. And so you see the glass panelled um, you know, uh, displays of piles of shoes that many of us have heard of who haven't visited, uh, the clothes, uh, the cases. And it, 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 it packs a meaningful and horrendous punch when you kind of only access what you don't see for the entire film as a modern person, as the cleaners are cleaning it. And then finally, for me, the most important moment in this film is a moment towards the end of the film when Rudolf Hoss, uh, in the process of being promoted, being told how successful he is as a, essentially a, uh, you know, as a Holocaust creator. He's so efficient at killing so many people that he's being promoted and given more responsibility. He's going to be responsible for the 700,000 Jews that are coming from Hungary, I believe. Um, and so there's a moment where he leaves this bureaucratic meeting where he's met the heads of other it's like literally it's like a um it's like a conference of unbelievably a conference of of concentration camp managers and he being the best there and he's there and he he actually phones home or talks to him tells his wife the queen of auschwitz back at home how he couldn't help but he you know he's talking about who was there who was at the kind of gathering when they were all kind of drinking and socializing after he said i couldn't really concentrate on who was there i was just looking at the room thinking about how many how much gas i would need to kill them all chilling but the chilling but the most chilling humanistic aspect of the whole film which i suppose could you could argue was is this jonathan glazer's attempt to even extract some kind of humanity from the awful character of Rudolf Hoss. As he's leaving this, this, this conference and he's going down the stairs, he suddenly stops and retches uncontrollably. And we just see it in an impact, you know, dispassionate wide shot of him just vomiting copiously onto the floor. And for me, this moment was everything I felt Jonathan Glazer was trying to create in us and, and does successfully. This wasn't him feeling anything morally. This was Rudolf Hoss's character at this point in the film is expelling himself through himself, not because he's feeling how awful what it is he's doing, but the very fact of what he's doing is so inhumane, it forces his human body to convulse and vomit. It's vomiting his own poison. And in that sense, it's like not even Rudolf Hoss can do this without there being some some consequence for him and albeit it's just that he's vomiting on the street but this is the extent of if it's inhumanity and the evil degradation of his morals through the industry in which he indulges is that this force this churning of even him like his mother-in-law who had to leave earlier in the film leave the house because she couldn't bear what the inference of everything was even his body he might not feel it he might not know the meaning of it or the importance of it but even his body his own di digestive tracts are repulsed by his own actions that it makes him heave. And this is a film that makes you spiritually heave. And it's an important lesson, as I've also said. It's a lesson that we need to learn from uh, and we need to think about in respect of all people on the planet, not just Jewish people, but all people who are a put-upon, controlled people uh, anywhere in the world.